So um, today we are welcome Johannes Nostrom as a speaker of our seminar. And uh, last time, uh, Johannes Nostrom uh, gave a talk in December uh, 18 on uh, regional homotopy type of the um, uh, k connected manifold of dimension uh, less than uh, 5k plus 3, right? And then uh, today, Johannes uh, shown, uh, is, uh, give a new progress on uh, his reason, but concentrated on the low dimension of seven and eight. Yes, please, uh, Johannes. Uh, th thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back virtually, at least. Um, so actually, in the title, I'm I'm saying seven and eight manifolds, but I'm, most of what I'm the, the, the actual work works in sort of a dimension range in a sense i've sort of improved the dimension range by by one since uh, since last time but uh, it's really it's really it's really it works for a range of dimension but i'm particularly the motivation for me is looking at simply connected seven and eight manifolds so i'm interested in trying to understand something about the rational homotopy of these things in particular whether they're formal and i guess the main thing i want to talk about is the technique that we have for uh, sort of reinterpreting massive products in a more tensorial way uh, that I think makes makes it more effective. So as uh, as you mentioned, I, I gave a talk here, well, in person actually uh, four years ago. So I guess that means I can dive straight into the into the gory details and just assume that you all remember what what I talked about four years ago. But uh, but maybe that's not such a good idea. So actually, I want to give a slightly more gentle introduction. I will recap some of the stuff that I said last time, but maybe in a little bit less detail, but partly to sort of make clear what the patterns are between the, the seven-dimensional story and the, the eight-dimensional story, or if you if like the story, the connection, how to move from stuff related to messy triple products to messy fourfold products. So the uh, the basics, the starting point is I'm interested in rational homotopy of spaces, well, manifolds in particular, uh, which you can translate into questions about quasi-isomorphism of commutative differential graded algebras. A basic, if you have a differential graded algebra, then the basic invariant of that is the is the cohomology, but actually the cohomology comes equipped with various more subtle structures. Uh, some of the most basic ones are the, the so-called massive products. But if you want to use those in practice, to if you have some actual manifolds and you want to answer some specific questions about is this manifold formal or something like that, uh, massive products can sometimes be a slightly blunt tool because of the way that they depend on making some choices, uh, but then the choices that you make actually can affect what the, what the final answer is. So if you make some choices, you compute away, and you get that your answer is non-zero, then you have to go back and check, well, is the, would changing the choices have, uh, would it be possible to change the choices to actually get zero, for instance? Now, one simple idea that you can use to reduce the dependence on choices is you can start with a massive product, and then you can multiply it by some suitable element in the algebra that kills off some of this dependence. Um, if you do that, then you, you may lose some information, but if you're in a setting where Poincaré duality holds, so particularly if you're looking at closed manifolds, which is what I'm usually interested in, then you actually you don't lose any information. So you might as well do this. Um, on the other hand, you don't necessarily gain very much information from doing this either. But what you can do is that sometimes um, these sort of tensor-like objects that you get when you multiply by a further element, you can actually relate, you can sort of make it something like a transformation. You can relate it to another tensor that actually does capture more information than the messy triple or fourfold products that you started with. And in some cases, we're able to uh, sort of say that these uh, messy tensors actually capture enough information to say something very decisive about your manifold, that provided that you're, you have a manifold of the right dimension range with the right connectivity. You know, the first few cohomology groups vanish, then uh, you can use it to, for instance, decide whether your manifold is formal, or you can use it to completely determine the rational homotopy type. So, 
just about quickly about the structure of the talks, I'm going to start with a little bit about background, just recapping something about rational homotopy and formality. Then I'll talk about Messi triple products and how to turn that into what we call the Bianchi Messi tensor and how that applies in particular to simply connected seven manifolds. So that's sort of what I was talking about four years ago already. Um, then I move on to talking about some newer stuff about fourfold messy products and how to turn that into a tensor, which in particular is relevant if you're looking at simply connected eight manifolds. And if I have time at the end, then I'll try to say something about the, the slight technicalities of how this, uh, how in the fourfold messy product story, you still have some dependence on choices. So the general philosophy is that this approach of tensorifying the messy products reduces the dependence on choices. When you start from massive triple products and you turn that into Bianchi massive tensor, then you basically eliminate the dependence on choices completely. So that's great. In when you start from massive fourfold products and you tensorify that, then in some situations you get rid of all the dependence, but in general, you can still have some dependence on the choices. That's still a little bit complicated. Uh, so I'll leave that part to the end. Any questions before I start? We'll start in proper. Okay, if not, then I go on. So, starting off just about with some definitions. Uh, so I'm I'm interested. I'm a geometer, so I like manifolds in particular. I want interested in questions like, oh, the, if I have if I have this in manifold that I'm interested for some reason, I have this manifold I'm interested in because they admit some nice uh, nice metrics or whatever, then are these two manifolds homeomorphic? Maybe that question is too hard, so maybe we move the goalpost a little bit and we say, well, maybe settle for asking, are these two manifolds uh, homotopy equivalent? But maybe that's still too hard, so maybe we then move the goalpost again and ask, are these two manifolds rationally homotopy equivalent? So if you have a homotopy equivalence between two spaces, then by then that induces isomorphisms in all the homotopy groups and by whitehead's theorem that's basically the converse basically holds if your spaces are at all same rational homotopy equivalence means that your map in, uh, rational homotopy equivalence map is something that induces isomorphisms on the rationalized homotopy groups so if you throw away all the torsion information then you get isomorphisms what I've written here is actually there's a typo there. I put Y brackets instead of a rationals in, in one instance, but that's just a typo. Now, if you have a rational, if you have a homotopy equivalence, then of course that's by definition sort of invertible up to homotopy. If you have a homotopy equivalence, homotopy equivalence going one way, then you also have a homotopy equivalence going the back. If you have a rational homotopy equivalence map in this sense, it doesn't necessarily have a rational homotopy equivalence map going back the other way. But the rational homotopy relation is somehow the symmetric closure of the relation of having a rational homotopy equivalence map. So two spaces of rational homotopy equivalent if there's a zigzag of, of uh, rational homotopy equivalence maps between them. Now the, the benefit of throwing away the tor torsion information and looking at rational homotopy equivalence instead of homotopy equivalence is that uh, it can be translated to a very algebraic problem uh, about commutative differential graded algebras. So if you have a, an actual smooth manifold, then one way you can describe its cohomology, at least with real coefficients, is you can look at the cohomology of its Durham complex, just the complex of differential forms. So from your smooth manifold, you cook up this uh, commutative differential graded algebra of forms, and from that you extract the cohomology. There's something similar you can do with any simplicial space. You can define a piecewise linear Durham complex, uh, which is still a commutative differential graded algebra, but now of the rational numbers instead of the reals. And when you take the cohomology, you get something that's isomorphic to the usual singular cohomology with rational coefficients. Uh, Quasi-isomorphism of commutative differential graded algebras is just a homomorphism such that the induced map on cohomology is an isomorphism. And basically looking at questions about rational homotopy equivalence of spaces is equivalent to looking at questions about quasi-isomorphism of their uh, associated piecewise linear Durham complexes. So 
obviously the, the most obvious invariant that you have under quasi isomorphism of these um, uh, DGAs is the cohomology. But in addition, you also have additional structures uh, on your on the cohomology that are invariant uh, under quasi isomorphisms, and these are things like massive products. In the context of spaces, if you ask what is the simplest possible space with a given rational um, with a given cohomology algebra, then that doesn't necessarily have a, a good answer. But in the context of uh, differential graded algebras, there is a good answer. If you have sp start with an algebra and you want to realize that as the cohomology algebra of a differential graded algebra, then the easiest way to do that is to just take the cohomology algebra itself and set the differential to be zero. Uh, so that's somehow the simplest possible um, DGA with a given cohomology algebra. And we say that our DGA is formal if um, it's quasi-isomorphic to the simplest um, DGA with a given cohomology algebra. So uh, another way of putting this is that if you know at the start that you see DGA is formal, then it's rational homo, then it's uh, quasi-isomorphism type is determined completely by the algebra. Looking at uh, closed manifolds, where we have Poincaré duality, then it turns out that if your manifold is dimension up to six, then it's automatically formal because the somehow isn't just, there's not enough. If you, have a, if you have a simply connected manifold, it can only have cohomology in degree two, three, four, and there just isn't enough stuff there to have some interesting additional structure that can make it not formal. More interestingly, there's a famous theorem of Deline, Griffiths, Morgan, and Sullivan that says that any closed Kähler manifold is formal. The sort of consequence of the DD bar lemma. So that means that if you if you pick an arbitrary closed eight manifold, then uh, this sort of gives you a way of showing that this eight manifold could not possibly be uh, have a complex uh, could not be a complex manifold with a Kähler metric on it. That's uh, Interest, one of the reasons that I'm interested in this is that in the case of uh, seven manifolds with autonomy G2 or eight manifolds with autonomy spin seven, there's very little known in the way of obstructions to admitting metrics with these holonomy groups. So if it were possible to prove that closed seven manifolds with autonomy G2 are always formal, then that would mean that at the stroke, we would rule out lots of closed manifolds that would then be proved not to admit any holonomy G2 metrics. Um, on the other hand, if you we have various ways of constructing closed seven manifolds with holonomy G2. So it would be interesting to sort of systematically test whether these manifolds are formal or not. And if we find one that isn't formal, then well, then then we know that um, th there's nothing th there's nothing to to do here. Um, but what's what has been missing to some extent is a is a good tool for for that makes it, it allows you to efficiently test whether simply connected seven manifolds are formal. And that's part of what um, the motivation for what I've been doing. All right. So if you want to test whether a manifold is formal, then you need to use some of these. It structures on the cohomology that go beyond just the, cup, the product on the cohomology, and also more generally, if you have if you have these additional invariants on the cohomology, then you can use that to try to distinguish uh, two different spaces, not just from the sort of formal space, but also from up to to non-formal. You can ask where two non-formal spaces are rationally homotopy equivalent to each other, and. Um, uh, the best thing then would be to find not just things that are capable of distinguishing between two different uh, things that are not rational homotopy equivalent, but they're able to completely classify things up to rational homotopy equivalents. And at least in the case of simply connected seven manifolds, we were able to do that. Okay, so one of the most basic tools that you have for detecting non formality and things like that are the, the massy products. And the simplest of these massy products is the massy triple product. So I, in order, to, before going on to say how to turn this into a tensor, I need to define the massy triple product itself. So the, ooh, I here I've forgotten an equal to zero. So in order to be able to define the massy triple product, you can't take the massy triple product of three arbitrary uh, elements in the cohomology. You need to have a triple of elements such that x1 times x2 is zero and x2 times x3 is zero. 
And to make things a little bit more concrete, I'm sticking to just taking products of elements in the degree two cohomology. Basically, the only reason for that is to avoid cluttering up with extra indices and extra signs uh, and extra things that keep track of whether things are commuting and, or anti-commuting. So we're just taking, in the case of simply connected seven manifolds or simply connected eight manifolds, is kind of interested in just taking products of degree two classes. So when I write down the definitions, I'm just going to stick to that. But there are various, uh, you know, everything I can say can pretty much be adapted to, uh, to something more general. Right, so you have this triple of uh, degree two cohomology classes. So you can then pick a co-chain representative for each of them. So just pick an element in the degree two part of your DGA that represents each of these cohomology classes. The hypothesis that x1 times x2 is zero means that alpha one times alpha two is an exact four form. So it's the differential of some uh, three form. So we pick one of these and call it gamma one, two. And uh, similarly, we have a, a th three, three co-chain gamma two, three, whose differential gives you alpha two times alpha three. When you look at alpha one times gamma two, three minus gamma one, two times alpha three, then the differential of that gives you alpha one, alpha two, alpha three minus itself. So it's going to be zero. So that means that you have a closed five chain. So you get an element of the degree five cohomology. The, um, this does depend on the choices that you made because if you add some closed uh, three cycle to, the, to gamma one, two, then you're going to change the cohomology class that you get out by multiplying some cohomology class in degree three cohomology class by, by X1, uh, well, X3 rather. But basically what happens if you look at the set of all things that you can obtain for all choices, then, uh, then you get a co-set uh, for X1 times the degree two part. So it should be X1 times degree three cohomology plus X3 times the degree three cohomology. Okay, so now I want to, how can you get rid of this dependence on choices? Well, one way to get rid of the dependence on choices is to multiply the massive triple product by a fourth element that sort of might kills off the choices. So to kill off the choice, because the choices, um, because you had a co-set that involved x1, a3 plus x3 times a3, what you need to multiply is by is something, some x4 such as x3 times x4 and x1 times x4 are both equal to zero. So if you do that, then you get an element in degree seven part cohomology that does not depend on the choices at all. In general, this could this some you could this is something you could always do, but in general, this will throw possibly throw away some information because it could well be that you degree seven cohomology of EDJ is just trivial, in which case you get no information at all from this. But if you have seven dimensional Poincaré duality, then knowing what the the in the product of the mass knowing the cup product of the massive triple product with all of these um, degree two classes actually recovers the massive triple product completely up to precisely the ambiguity that you had in the definition. So if you do this on uh, a closed seven dimensional manifold, then switching to, to this thing that's independent of choices doesn't actually lose you any information at all. Okay. Now, what sort of the, the other thing that is good about switching to this um, sort of four tensor like thing is that it becomes a little bit more transparent what symmetries you have. Because in the massive triple product, you actually have various symmetries. Um, but if all the massive triple products are defined, because all the the product of all classes in H2, if the, if the product from H2 times H2 to H4 is trivial, so that all mass triple products are defined, then you can think of, of this as some kind of four tensor. And you can, that, that four tensor has some symmetries that you can study. The problem is what happens if the product on the degree two cohomology is not trivial, then you, the conditions that you need to define the massive triple product, and hence this uh, this function m of four variables, those are not linear conditions. So somehow don't cut up, you don't get a well-defined linear subspace of this fourth tensor power of um, the second cohomology. So you need to do something else. So 
So to explain what that something else is, I need to introduce a little bit of notation. So first of all, uh, we have the, I use PK to denote the kth symmetric power of a, of a vector space. Uh, most people would use SK, I guess. I, I kind of like using PK just because it um, makes me think of homogeneous degree K polynomials, which um, is sort of a useful picture to have in mind if one tries to do this over the integers. In this talk, I'm just working over the rational numbers, but you can try to do some of this over the integers instead. And uh, the other thing that plays a role is the kernel of the product map from degree two cohomology to degree four cohomology. So that will then be a subspace of um, the symmetric square of the degree two cohomology. And I'll denote that by E. So I, I wrote down this uh, function M of four arguments before. So I, I now want to sort of split that into two parts. The first part is just takes four elements of the degree two cohomology that satisfy the vanishing condition that we need. And it maps it into something in the symmetric square of the kernel of the cup product map. So you just map x1, x2, x3 times x4 to x1 times x2. That gives you an element in the kernel of the cup product. And then you take the symmetric product of that with x3 times x4, which is something else in the kernel of the cup product. And then you subtract off x2, x3 times x4, x1. So that's certainly a function that you can define. Now we can also define, try to define a function, a linear map even from this symmetric square of this kernel to degree seven cohomology. By first picking a linear, instead of picking uh, cochain representatives for the four elements, x1, x2, x3, x4, we take a linear map from the degree two cohomology to the degree two part of the, the algebra that picks out a representative for each of them. We can take the square of that uh, map so to get a map from the symmetric square of degree two cohomology into the degree four cochains. The restriction of that to, uh, to the kernel of this map gives you exact things. So that means that you can find, you can pick some linear map from this kernel to the degree three cochain such that alpha squared restricted to th that kernel is the differential of gamma. So there's a crucial D missing in, in the equation here for defining gamma. Um, okay, and then from that, you can define a linear map from the symmetric square of uh, the kernel of the algebra product to degree seven cohomology by um, sort of applying gamma to one of these and alpha squared to the other. That gives you some closed values. Um, well, yeah, so now the, so you sort of split it in two parts. The nice thing is that this map B, it doesn't actually just take values in, you can't get any element in the symmetric square of this kernel. You always get things that lie in the kernel, the full symmetrization map. So if basically if you just throw away these brackets and you let everything commute, then you just get zero. So the first step takes values in, in the kernel of this full symmetrization. And when you define, look at this expression defined on that kernel, then you get something that is completely independent of all the choices. And um, that's what we call the Bianchi messy tensor. So the reason for the name is that the, you're looking at something that involves basically the kernel of the map that goes from symmetric square of symmetric square into symmetric fourth power. That means that you're looking at tensors that are closely related to tensors that have the symmetries of the Riemann curvature tensor. In particular, this full symmetrization condition being in the kernel of full symmetrization, that sort of corresponds to the Bianchi identity. So it's really the Bianchi identity that's the, the really interesting part here. Uh, so that's why when we are trying to come up with a name for it, we ended up calling it the Bianchi messy tensor. Okay, so, so the object is that what we had before was something that by just taking this naive thing of taking the messy triple products and multiplying by a fourth element, you got a function of four arguments that in the case where the cup product, the product, algebra product in H2 was trivial, you could interpret as a tensor. 
but by making this change of perspective, you actually get something that's a well-defined tensor in all cases. Um, if the, in some situations, you can span the domain of the Bianchi Messi tensor by just these things that correspond to Messi triple products. In such a situation, the Bianchi Messi tensor will be completely determined by Messi triple products. Um, but that doesn't always happen. There are many situations where, where actually there are no defined Messi triple products at all, but this uh, this vector space can still be non-trivial, and so that, then the Bianchi Messi tensor will have some interesting information. On the other hand, the um, Bianchi Messi tensor definitely determines the these products of Messi triple products with other things. Under Poincaré radiality, you can then go back and say that that determines the Messi triple products. So under Poincaré radiality, the Bianchi Messi tensor always contains at least as much information as the Messi triple products. The uh, Bianchi Messi tensor also has a nice functor reality property that um, somehow it behaves nicely if um, if you have a homomorphism between two differential graded algebras, then the Bianchi Messi tensor behaves the way you would expect it to. And it's also a useful obstruction to formality. If your DGA is formal, then the Bianchi Messi tensor definitely has to be zero, just like all the Messi triple products. But um, the one of the powers of the Bianchi Messi tensor is that actually, unlike the Messi triple products, it can uh, be used in a classification statement. So if you have a simply connected uh, seven, closed seven manifold, so it um, has seven dimensional Poincaré radiality, then the, the rational homotopy type of your closed seven manifold is determined by just the cohomology algebra and the Bianchi Messi tensor. And corresponding statement for DGAs is that the something like the quasi isomorphism class of a DGA that has H1 equals zero and satisfies seven dimensional Poincaré radiality is just determined by the isomorphism class of its cohomology algebra and the Bianchi Messi tensor. So if you have two if you have two such DGAs and you have a homomorphism, if you have an isomorphism between the cohomology algebras that intertwines the um, Bianchi Messi tensors, then that is realized as the push forward of a, uh, of a, um, well, of a zigzag or quasi-isomorphisms. So this isn't actually that special to working in dimension seven. If you, it's just that if you have a higher, if your manifolds are higher dimensional, then you need to have a more bigger connectivity assumption to rule out the the possibility of uh, that fourfold massive products and things like that will play a role. So all this works if you if you take n greater than or equal to two and you look at n minus one connected things of dimension up to five n minus three, there's actually a type of this two should be a three, uh, then everything works the same. It's just you need to be, when you just need to define the Bianchi Messi tensor appropriately. Instead of just using uh, symmetric powers, you need to use graded commutative powers and you need to introduce various signs in various points to make everything work. All right, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, some of the selling points, if I, if I was trying to market people to you know, come and buy my beautiful uh, new tensor, then the advantages compared with the uh, Messi triple products is that you never have to worry about dependence on choices. Um, it's sort of computable. Um, I mean, it, it, it's computable in the sense that the Messi triple products are computable. You, know, you pick some representatives and you, you get the answer, but also, once you have compute, done that computation, you don't because of the independence of choices, you don't need to go back and check, well, what would happen if I change my choices? So you just do the computation once and then it's done. And the other good thing is that, like I said, if you look at the message triple products, there are some symmetries there, but it's a little bit hard to make explicit what those symmetries are. On the other hand, with the Bianchi message tensor, so you know exactly what the relevant symmetries are. So you know precisely how many components of this tensor there are to compute. Basically, it's just a, a, a function on the on this vector space that we defined. So if you know the dimension of that vector space, and that tells you how many rational numbers I need to compute to decide um, whether my closed seven manifold is formal or not. Okay. 
Any questions? No. Uh, just a quick one, just to see if yeah. I'm getting it correctly. So the homotopy type in the statement is rational homotopy type, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Well, maybe maybe because I'm talking about DGAs, maybe I should say the quasar is more for some type. Of yeah, system. I was pretty but sure. Yeah. Yeah. Homotopy is always rational, but just to be yeah. sure, not, not, yeah. not, not to get lost for, for things about. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so that was kind of um, the picture of. Uh, as I as I sort of told you. Just one question, Mark. That you need you say that the uh, computable so that it, you only compute for example you found for how to say, um, uh, holonomy seven manifold. Uh, you have a hundred or thousand example. Can you compute them on uh, on these example? Well, the yes. the The problem the problem is there is not so much computing it as the fact that. I mean, when you make lots of and lots of examples from twisted connected sums, then they're sort of the um, degree two cohomology is usually quite small, and that makes it uh, so. This is kind of it's almost automatically going to be trivial yeah. a priori. And there are a few, and there are a few examples where the it's quite difficult to make examples where the cohomology degree two cohomology is big enough that you have a chance that that it could could at all be be non trivial. So by the time you've made the come up, you have to choose things very carefully to make those examples. And by the time you get an example, you sort of made so many you made so many things sort of nice and symmetric that those choices, those nice and symmetric choices that you made somehow kill off the Bianchi Messi tensor again. Um, and if you're looking at uh, orbifold resolutions, well, I mean it is in principle computable, but you do still need to. The, the most obvious way, if you want to compute it by hand, so to speak, of making co-chain choices, well, you know how many things there are to compute, but it's it's still kind of pretty fiddly to make all those co-chain choices. There's some work by Haimanov and Aman that sort of works this out in a in a in one of jo the most sim in the simplest of Joyce's examples, and there they get zero. Uh, in principle, one can one can do it for the rest of Joyce's examples as well, but it sort of gets more and more complicated. So, so I should say, yeah, it's sort of in principle computable. But the like I say, one of the selling points is once you've once you've done this hard computation, at least you know that you've you've finished it. It's uh, once you've done this hard computation, you know that there's nothing more to do. Yes, I I, I wonder. That's the motivation. It's very clear how you came to that construction. But nobody before, yeah, totally, yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Okay. So the um, the interesting thing is that something is part of the reason for for retelling this story is that the the story for four um, for fourfold products is sort of analogous. Um, uh, it's it's more complicated, but there's there's quite a strong analogy. Uh, so first, I need to say something about how to define the fourfold products rather than the triple products. So, just like with the triple products, you need to, you, to define a fourfold product of four elements in the degree two cohomology. You need to have some pairwise vanishing of their products in the degree four cohomology, like before. That pairwise vanishing, in particular, means that the, it makes sense to talk about the massive triple products of x one, x two, x three, and x two, x three, x four. For the fourfold product to vanish, you need to be able to make the choices in the definition of the threefold products such that those both vanish. If those both vanish, in if it's possible to make the, those choices so that the triple products vanish, that means that the representing code chains here become exact. So you can write those as differentials of some uh, degree four elements. And if you then look at the expression here, you get something that's always closed. Uh, so that uh, then gives you a representative of the fourfold massive product. It's a bit more complicated than the massive triple products, though, because the way you change uh, when you change alpha and gamma, you somehow don't just get linear change in the for the massive triple products. You somehow just got a linear or affine linear change to the result of the massive triple product. So the the set of possible things you get out of this was just a co-set. In, for the fourfold massive products, you get some sort of quadratic dependence on some of the choices of gamma and so on. So that's that's more complicated. 
it becomes a little bit more similar to what we had before if we think of fixing the choices of alpha and gamma and only allow the choices of these sigmas to vary. If, if sigmas are the only thing we allow to vary, then the remaining ambiguity is still uh, this kind of coset. Which also means that if we fix alpha and gamma, then we can still do the same trick of eliminating the remaining ambiguity by multiplying by a fifth class that annihilates both x1 and x5. So if we have a uh, quintuple of elements, such as not just x1, x2, x2, x3, and x3, x4 are zero, but also x4 times x5 and x5 times x1 are zero, then we can multiply this fourfold product with the last one and get something that is only going to depend on alpha, the choices of alpha and gamma. But moreover, when you, when you do that and you work out how does this thing depend on alpha and gamma, you get something that's actually quite symmetric in uh, permuting all five variables. So if you start with this expression for the massive fourfold product, we multiply by fifth element, we expand out, then we have something that involves both the alphas, the gammas, and the sigmas. But we can then use the Leibniz rule to somehow move the differential from the gamma factor to the sigma factor. And then the differential of sigma is expressed in terms of alphas and gammas. So you get this final expression that just involves the alphas and the gammas. We kind of knew that such a thing should exist. But when you arrive at this actual explicit expression, you see that it's uh, very nice and symmetric. It's symmetric on the um, just cyclic permutations of, of the x1, of the xi. So we can now do a similar kind of thing as in when I was describing the bianchi messi tensor, that you think of this operation that takes far a quintuple and spits out a cohomology class in degree eight as a composition of first taking a quintuple of elements and somehow symmetrizing that and getting an element of a, of a tensor product, and then applying a linear map to that. So just like in when we define the bianchi messi tensor, you sort of make a uniform choice of representatives for all degree two cohomology classes, i.e. you pick a, I mean, you have a, you have this projection map from closed degree two elements to the cohomology, you pick an, in, uh, there's a left inverse or right inverse. I can never get this right, but you sort of pick representatives of the cohomology class in a linear way. You then um, uh, pick uh, a gamma that witnesses the exactness of uh, the things in the in the kernel, and then you can define a linear map on uh, this tensor product by so taking this alpha times x times gamma u times gamma v. Um, okay, so I want to say in, just like in the bianchi messi tensor, we have to say something about what are, what are the symmetries that these things, um, the, the things in the image of this map satisfy. So let's consider the case when the product, the algebra product on H2 is trivial. So that this kernel of the algebra product is the whole symmetric square of, of the degree two cohomology. In that setting, you this star map that I defined, it uses a linear map from the fifth tensor power of the cohomology to cohomology tensored with lambda two of the symmetric square of H2. The image of this, this linear map fits into some kind of exact sequence. So the image is precisely the kernel of a map from here that goes to symmetric cube times symmetric square, which is a fairly natural map. So this, um, this gadget is an reduced representation of the general linear group. You can compute the dimension from, well, you can compute the dimension either by thinking of by sort of finishing off the exact sequence that um, these are part of, or you can identify what the, I mean, because the representation of, of the general linear group, you can identify it with a, with a partition and then sort of just the partition you get is three, one, one. And you can look up the uh, suitable formula for the, what the dimension of that representation is. Anyway. 
we, we have this, uh, the, this, the kernel of this map gives you a vector space. Uh, you can define on that vector space if you know, if, if the product map on the cohomology is trivial, then you would be able to cook up this, this tensor on, defined on this vector space just by knowing all the massive fourfold products. But if you, the cup product map is not trivial, you still get something sensible on the intersection of the kernel of this map with when, what you get when you replace this symmetric square of the cohomology with just the kernel of the algebra product. So the domain of our new messy tensor is going to be this space here. So basically I already wrote down the definition, but now just to put it all, all in one place, what we do is we pick a uniform choice of representatives. So we pick, take this linear map from the degree two cohomology to degree two co-chains. We pick a gamma. So it's, okay, I once again managed to forget the D here. So D of gamma should give you alpha squared when you apply it to something in the kernel of the uh, product in H2. And then we get a well-defined map from the domain that I wrote down to the degree eight cohomology by sort of making alpha e to the first factor and then making gamma e to the, each of the two other factors and multiplying everything together. So somewhat amazingly that, that always gives you a closed co-chain. The situation is not quite as nice for the bianchi messi tensor. For the bianchi messi tensor, we said, oh, well, actually, this doesn't depend on the, the choices that we made at all. In this setting, you do get some dependence of choices, but there are at least some situations where you can eliminate the dependence of choices. So the first of these is when the degree three cohomology is trivial. That was also the setting where some other, just looking at the fourfold products, gave you just a co-set. When some of the co the dependence of the the ambiguity in the fourfold products also became a little bit simpler. So in a setting where the ambiguity in the fourfold products is a bit simpler than usual, the this pentagonal messy tensor becomes completely unambiguous. Also, the the way that it depends on the choices. I'll say something about it towards the end. I think I'll have time. It depends a bit on the on the Bianchi Messi tensor. It sort of depends on the thing one step down. So in particular, if the Bianchi Messi tensor is zero and you have punk radiality, then you can, in a certain sense, say that you have a unique value for this uh, pentagonal Messi, ten Messi tensor. It's not quite that you have a unique choice, but there's a sort of a class of choices, all of which give the same answer for the for the pentagonal Messi tensor. You can use this as a to test for formality. So if you have a formal DGA, then you can always have some choices that make the pentagonal messy tensor zero. And in the case where we have punk radiality, you can express it in a slightly simpler way. You can say that, well, first of all, you must have that the Bianchi messy tensor is zero. And then because the Bianchi messy tensor is zero, you have a unique value for P and that value of P must also be zero. Um, we would like to use this in, a, we would like to use this pentagonal messy tensor uh, in the classification result for simply connected eight manifolds, like we use the Bianchi messy tensor to classify simply connected seven manifolds. We've not been able to quite do that yet. What we've done so far is at least say that this gives you a criterion for formality. So, for a, something that satisfies Poincaré radiality to be formal, it's a necessary condition that the Bianchi messy tensor and the pentagonal messy tensor both vanish in a certain dimension range, in particular for simply connected eight manifolds, um, that's uh, the converse, it's also true. Um, now, the, the we could sort of conjecture that actually it should be true that the pentagonal messy tensor is, um, helps you classify things up to that in that same dimension range, you should also get a classification result. So here I've just stated a, a special case of this conjecture where the Bianchi mass tensor is zero because otherwise it's a bit harder to um, say precisely what the, what the conjecture should be. I'll get to the functoriality required at the end. 
But we also have a sort of a, a test case, which is that my, my collaborator, Chaba, Chaba Naj, he, in his thesis, he was studying the diffeomorphism classification of simply connected eight manifolds, which have the cohomology of connected sums of S2 times S6 with themselves. So in other words, you look at things where the second cohomology is just um, Z to the R for some R, and you have no cohomology in degree three and degree four. If you choose, if you sort of look at the set of polarized such manifolds, so such manifolds with a, not just with a chosen isomorphism between H2 and ZR, then you can make that into a group under a parametric connected sum, meaning you take a connected sum of two of these things, and then because both of them had isomorphism between H2 and ZR, that tells you how to somehow kill off certain um, two spheres. You do, do some surgeries to get back to something that has H2 isomorphic to ZR. So you can make these gadgets into a group, and Shaba computed what that group is. And it has a free part of rank of a certain rank. And has this should be a Z mod two. Sorry, this is so it has a two torsion part of a certain rank. And you may you will what you will notice is that the rank of the free part is precisely the same as the dimension of the domain of um, this pentagonal messy tensor. So that's what then what led us to believe that well actually there should be some connection here. Maybe the pentagonal messy tensor precisely detects this free part, and that's exactly what happens. So in the in the this special case uh, for these sort of simply connected eight manifolds that with the the cohomology of uh, just connect sums of S two times S six, knowing that metagonal messy tensor determines uh, the topology of your manifold up to just this sort of two torsion ambiguity. Um, Okay, any questions? I have some questions. Of course, the first theorem of you is now he does if and only if, but only if the obvious, right? And the second thing is that, how to say, as a functionality of the B sub functionality of F, can you prove it? Or you already proved? Uh, yes, so I'll, that's what I'm about to explain. So the, pr the problem with explaining the functionality of P is. Yeah, you need to compare. Uh, you need to compare. Yeah, the the, the pentagonal mass tensor of two different things, but each of those two different things has its own. You can involve the choices. You need to understand the dependence on the choices before you can even say what functionality should mean. So um, that so that's what I'm going to do in the final in uh -huh. the final part. Okay. Yeah, so, so the answer on theorem of Nagy that means that you have the formula and you uh, how to say glue mean if uh, the simply connected or the covalent connected sum or uh, uh, resolution of singularity or blowing up, then you can uh, the defy see the uh, tensor on the new manifold uh, from the, uh, the gluing pro of some, uh, some mind, right? You have the formula. Um... Maybe I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it like that. I haven't really, in earnest, tried to compute these pentagonal mass tensors of of anything. It's still. Uh, so that's the Z theorem of Nagy is a, a simply you can look at the new manifold and compute it, but not uh, because you have some formula for connected sum, right? Uh, so no. I mean... I, I, oh, sorry, I thought that you. Oh, that's sorry. So that I because he also say I was a. Resolution of singularity. So I thought that uh, you you can compute. Uh, yeah. So 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 that uh, you have have never think about the formula of uh, connected sum. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I understood. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So uh, I want to finish off then by saying something about what um, some of these slight technical details about the dependence of choices. So we. To define the Pythagorean messy tensor, we, what we chose was uh, this linear map that picks out representatives of the cohomology classes and the, this linear map gamma, such that d gamma is alpha squared when, when possible. For once, I managed to include the, the differential here. Um, so 
before saying how the Pythagorean mass tensor depends on choices, I want to say what I mean by two choices to be equivalent. So whenever you have two different choices, if you have sort of a, an alpha gamma and an alpha prime gamma prime, then you can first pick a linear map from H2 to the one forms, such as D beta is alpha prime minus, okay, that should be alpha. Um, if you then look at this linear map, then that takes closed values on, on E. So that gives you a linear map from this, this E, the kernel of the, of the algebra product, to degree three cohomology classes. The, this delta also depends on choices, actually. So it depends on the choice of beta. But uh, we can say that two choices, C and C prime, are equivalent if it's possible to choose beta such that this delta is zero. And uh, so my, it's two, in everything that follows, whenever you have two equivalent choices, then uh, the choice of beta is never going to matter. So you can, someone can use any beta you want in defining the delta, and uh, it won't make a difference. To express how the transformation rule for the Pythagorean Messi tensor, you need to say something about, you have to capture something about the Messi triple products. Now, the, I've made a big song and dance of how, about how great the Bianchi Messi tensor is at capturing the information about the Messi triple products, but actually it turns out that the Bianchi Messi tensor doesn't do quite enough to describe the transformation rule for the Pythagorean Messi tensor. So instead, you have to do something similar. So use some of the similar ideas of playing around with kernels of symmetrization maps to define a uniform version of the Messi triple product. So instead of having the Messi triple product, which is something, a function of three arguments, it's in, for instance, the degree two cohomology that spits out the degree five cohomology class, we want to turn that into some kind of linear map. In this case, the domain of the linear map will be the kernel but full symmetrization from degree two cohomology tensed with the kernel of the product from H2 to H4 going into the third symmetric power of the uh, degree two cohomology. We can define a linear map on, on that kernel if we start with one of these choices, alpha gamma. And uh, this is something that does depend on the choice, but we have a, a well-behaved transformation rule. So if you have two choices and you know what the difference between them is in terms of this linear map from E to the degree three cohomology, then you can take that map delta from E to the degree three cohomology. You can sort of multiply it by the identity map from degree two cohomology to degree two cohomology. That gives you a linear map from tensor product of the degree two cohomology to times E going into degree five cohomology can then restrict that to the domain of the uniform Messi triple product, and that will be the difference between the Messi triple, uniform Messi triple products for, for those two choices. So in one sense, the this uniform Messi triple product doesn't really give you very much more than the Bianchi Messi tensor, because in the situation where you have functor radiality, then if you know the Bianchi Messi tensor, then you know the set of values that the uniform Messy triple product can take. But in the the issue is that in the transformation rule for the for the pentagonal messy tensor, you don't just need to know what the what the image is of this map that sends choices to uniform triple products. So the image is something that you get by just knowing the bank messy tensor, but you actually need to know the, the function itself. You actually need to know which choices correspond to which uniform triple products. Okay, so here's the slightly gory transformation rule for the for the Pythagorean Messi tensor. I don't know how realistic it is to absorb any of it in just going through it in a slide, but I just want to write down sort of roughly what it looks like. We have this domain for the Pythagorean Messi tensor. If you have a, some an object of the type that the uniform triple product has, and if you have an object that's of the type that the difference between two choices has, then there is a way to multiply them together to get a linear map from the domain of the Pythagorean Messi tensor to the degree eight cohomology. 
And when you look at the difference of the pentagonal message tenses defined using two different choices, then the difference involved this product of the uniform message uh, triple product with the difference and a second term that's, well, a similar kind of product, but where you involving the square of the difference. The, um, the interesting thing is that you get out of this transformation rule is one is that if, if the uniform message triple product vanishes, if the sum choice that makes the uniform message triple product vanish, and you compare the pentagonal messy tensor for two different such choices, then the right hand side works out to zero. So in the set setting where there is some choice where the uniform messy triple product vanishes, then somehow you get a canonical value for, for the pentagonal messy tensor. So in that sense, the pentagonal messy tensor is independent of choices that way. It's, um, I mean, you can make a different choice, but there's a right choice to make. So in particular, that happens in the case where you have Poincaré duality and the Bianchi messy tensor vanishes. You get a formality obstruction out of this. So formality implies that there exists some choice that makes both the uniform messy triple product and the pentagonal messy tensor vanish at the same time. And the other comment to make about this is that this transformation rule is somehow quadratic in nature. So if you if if you look at some other, I don't know if you can call this the discrete second derivative of something on on the on the left hand side, but it's some this is some kind of bilinear the diff, this different the second order difference is some kind of bilinear object. So you should think of this as uh, some the pentagonal messy tensor is defending in some affine quadratic way on the choices that you made. And that will sort of come what makes it a bit complicated. It's not just that it's lin, it depends, doesn't depend on the choices in the linear way, it depends in some sort of quadratic way. Um, but once you understand this dependence on choices, then you can actually see that as a special case of a functor reality statement. So if you have a homomorphism between two DJs and you made a choice of, you made some co-chain choices on one DJ to define the Pythagorean messy tensor there. We made some co-chain choices on the other DJ to define the Pythagorean messy tensor there. Then in a similar way to how we could sort of define a difference between two choices on the same DJ, there's also a way to define a difference between, relative to this homomorphism, difference between two choices on these two different DJs. And then if the, uh, in the case of Bianchi Messi tensor, we sort of had a similar statement where the right hand side was just zero, but in this case, we get the right hand side that involves this difference of choices. So if you special take this functorality statement, you specialize the case where the homomorphism is just the identity map on your DJ, then this is just the transformation rule that I wrote down on the, on the previous slide. But uh, one way or another, the point is that there exists some nice functorality statement. And once you have some nice functorality statement, then you can, for instance, make a conjecture that this pentagonal messy tensor helps you classify simply connected data manifolds. Um, another nice uh, consequence of this is you get a statement about sort of formal domination in the dimension range where the pentagonal messy tensor gives a formality criterion. So if you have a map of non-zero degree between closed manifolds, then if the Bianchi messy tensor and pentagonal messy tensor of the domain both vanish, then the same has to be true on the co-domain. So if you are in the dimension range where formality is equal is equivalent to the vanishing of the Bianchi messy tensor and the pentagonal messy tensor, then having a map of non-zero degree. Uh, from a formal manifold implies that the co-domain is also formal. Uh, so it's, that's something it would be interesting to know where that's true more generally that whenever you have a map of non-zero degree from a formal man manifold to something else, does the co-domain also have to be formal? Uh, you have made so, so that I confused a little bit, so how to say, if manifold is a formal then on must say product is zero, right? Yeah. So then is a uh, uh, um, Bianchi Massey uh, tensor uh, uh, also zero? Yeah. But the Pentagon also zero? Yeah. So that, that 
um... so so that's the only question when you know, when you have the how to say non zero uh non zero so you ask us um rational home to be tied when these uh, f and p are not zero then you 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 then know that yeah you classify. i see yeah. yeah yeah so the the statement would be I mean, you, you you want the the conject the more general conjecture would be that if you have um, a simply if you have a pair of simply connected eight manifolds, and you have an isomorphism of their cohomology algebras that intertwines the Bianchi mesa tensors and intertwines the pentagonal mesa tensors yes. in this sense, then that isomorphism of the cohomology algebras would be realized by uh, by rational homotopy equivalence. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that was um, uh, that's taking me to the end of my yes. talk. Yes, thank you very much for very uh, uh, clear and uh, talk and very interesting also. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So um, uh, Domenico, do you want to make some comment uh, on the uh, our work on the A infinity? Oh, for sure. But let's first thank you Anna for the beautiful talk. Okay, so no, that, not a comment, but something I've been investigating with Van and Totalo Kavai and Laura uh, Schwarzhofer. Uh, in the over the reals rather than on the rationals, then we can use the Deram algebra. And in that case, for seven dimensional manifold, we were able to prove that. Uh, your Bianchi Massey tensor is equivalent to the Caledic class for a certain A3 algebra structure on, on the cohomology. And now we are strongly su suspecting that this additional pentagonal Massey tensor uh, is, is related to an A4 structure for eight manifolds. Uh, have you had some thought in this direction? Or? Well, I'm not very much. I mean, in the for well, the Bianchi Mesa tensor, we did some work to say, well, under point radiality, the Bianchi Mesa tensor determines the uniform Mesa triple product. And we sort of made an argument that in a certain sense, the uniform Mesa triple product is equivalent to the sort of triple product in an A, A infinity yeah. structure. Uh, but I haven't thought about the the analogous claim for the pentagonal messy tensor. It's um, yeah, yeah it's, it 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 gets it gets complicated. <laughs> so actually, I, uh, yes, we we have the more complicated computations. That's a much okay. more complicated okay. than in the yeah. Mesa. But no, no, I I I didn't I didn't pursue that. I was sort of, I mean, ultimately, I my my interest is I, I want sort of. I, I, I'm interested in the more general picture when when it seems within easy reach, but but when it when it seems hard, then I sort of prefer to just stick to the things that will will seem like they're more likely to just help me with my applications ultimately that help me answer questions about the potential G two manifolds and and spin seven manifolds. So I haven't I haven't thought about the the, the sort of a three a four a infinity story uh, uh, too much. Dominico, that a, a Galilean structure is a uh, theorem is also for um, how to say any coefficient, rational coefficient, right? Yes. So where we need to be on the reals is improving that uh, if the Bianchi Massey tensor vanishes, then the manifold is formal. The, the converse is always good. I mean, if the manifold is formal, then the the Caledian class and so the Bianchi Massey tensor vanishes. And that's also overkill for us to, but the converse we are only able to, to do over the years. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so uh, somehow because I think that's a, in dimension, eight computation is a much more complicated and uh, somehow you also go into some uh, higher level of cohomology. So why not look at the Caledian uh, paper? Because what he he proved is a cohomology class of such a kind of structure, defines the 
uh, 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 Calidin group, the so, uh, only formality or defines the uh, uh, structure of affinity algebra Domenico? Yeah, so, so the name Calidin is you, you take a CDGA and then, then there's a, 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 a sequence of tensors that are the obstruction to the formality. Yes, so that, uh, that kind of, of abstraction, but not the, uh, the only abstraction, right? That yes, so, so in, in, so in that case, 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 that's a, uh, yeah. We, we can think of an M3, yeah. which is the first obstruction, then an M4, then an M5, and so on. So what is difficult is to say that, say, okay, but M3 will be, in this case, the only obstruction. And this means that a priori, a priori you, you have to prove that M4, M5, and 6 are zero. And that is difficult. So that is what we are able to prove over the reals. And it, this is what UNS is able to prove over Q using the, the mass APNT tensor rather than collecting directly. And, 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 and then for degree four, the same. So in, in the correct dimension range, we are able over R to say that M5, M6, and 7 will be zero. Uh, but we are not able to do this over Q because we still have not proven the exact equivalence with uh, the pentagonal mass saving. So this is where we, we yes. are. Right now. So, 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 so someone is ringing the, the door and, and opening and being back. Yes. Yeah. So is there more uh, questions? So uh, if there is no question, so let us thank the speaker again, yeah? Thanks for your uh, uh, really beautiful talk. Uh, I enjoyed it from the beginning to the end, very, very nice. Thank you, glad you yeah. enjoyed it.